Hello and welcome on Watches TV for a new edition of Primetime Watchmaking in the News. And yes, I know it's been a little while that we didn't do one of these shows. We've been extremely busy and working on a really meaningful project I hope I'll be able to share with you in the near future, something I wanted to do for years and years, and now the timing seems pretty right. Well, enough teasing on this and let's now dive into this new edition of Primetime as we have quite a few things to talk about and before telling you more about this pretty crazy piece I'm wearing today, well, of course, uh, we have some other stories and updates to come back on. In this unusual context, uh, though things are gently getting back to normal around here, bars and restaurants have reopened, not fully, but getting there. Okay, on a business standpoint for the industry, we can't say it's really the case, and we are actually looking at an acceleration of trends witnessed before. Numbers of watches produced in Switzerland continues to go down, and the average mean price continues to go up, and I'll illustrate this with the export statistics of April. Compared to 2019, more or less the same volume in terms of turnover, so not too bad, but in reality, minus 25% in terms of number of watches exported. That's really significant. And if you look closer at these numbers, you'll see that watches made out of other material than metal, meaning mainly plastic watches, such as Swatch watches, are down by minus 44% and demonstrate some kind of end of an era. Only watches above 3,000 Swiss francs, so their number will go up by 4%. But these watches representing only 12% of the total volume account for 75% of the overall turnover. So yes, there are for sure big concerns for the industry and I'll come back on this later with the importance of innovation to continue to propose something appealing. So let's continue with a little update regarding watch shows since we finally got some fresh info with some dates. Not much more to be honest and I'll be uh, chronological about this. So here in Geneva, starting on the 30th of August, uh, will be held the new edition of the Geneva Watch Days and lasting uh, till Friday the 3rd. More or less the same format as last year, brands will be able to organize things uh, their very own way and they will do so in hotels and other showrooms uh, scattered around the city of Geneva. But since uh, Geneva is about the size of a big village, well, you'll be able to go from one place to the other by foot pretty easily. In terms of brands, uh, the organization is talking about 2025 brands uh, ranging from Bulgari to uh, Breitling, De Bethune, H. Moser, MBNF, Oberg, Ferdinand Berthou, Arnold & Son, Maurice Lacroix and Oris. And the full and definite list uh, will be uh, known shortly and we'll update uh, this on our website. So just a couple of days after the the start of this initial event and for the very first time will be held in Neuchâtel and by the lake, the Salon Imagination initiated by the people that were behind the Swiss Creative Lab seen during Basel World. So this show will last from the 1st of September till the 5th and will be a mix uh, between watch brands, but we don't yet uh, know who they will be, but also some jewelry brands and precious stones dealers as well as writing instrument brands. They are expecting around 100 exhibitors, sounds pretty ambitious, and hopefully we'll know more in the coming days or weeks. But the organizers have already announced that the second edition will take place in early May of 2022, and the idea is of course a good one and represent an alternative to what will happen in Geneva since we also learned that the new version of Watches and Wonders will occur between the 30th of March to the 5th of April of 2022. But for this one, again, still no news uh, regarding the exact format of the full list of attending brands. Of course, Richmond brands and some other big names will be there. So for those uh, not being able to participate, well, that's where the, this imagination Neuchâtel option could become uh, really useful as we know that the prices are reasonable for brands to participate. And we know that local authorities are really behind this project. And I say this because I haven't yet talked about ex Basel World, as they were supposed to hold uh, an online press conference to keep us uh, posted and they just cancelled it. But uh, what we know for sure is that their intent of having a show this year in July has been abandoned. No clear announcements about it, just like we all forgot about it. But it seems that they will also try to revive the show on approximately the same dates as Watches and Wonder. So it really looks like everyone is going back to business as usual, but things have for sure changed and priorities have changed and I doubt all these options will be clear winners. At least people are trying, but overall it again really saddens me that the industry hasn't been able to seize this fantastic opportunity of laying everything back on a clean sheet of paper and come with a unified format for the better of the industry as a whole. 
Anyhow, and last show I will quickly mention is uh, that the EPHG, the trade fair dedicated to the supplies of the industry, will take place between the 14th and 17th of September of this year here in Geneva. And always a very pleasant moment and will be a good indicator of how the industry is really going. These suppliers do tell us some very interesting stories. So as you can see, a lot of dates, but still quite vague in terms of who and how. But if you're in Mexico, you can immediately focus on the lighter edition of the CR taking place in Mexico City between the 15th and 17th of June, a show held at the Four Seasons Hotel and the first sign of things going in the right direction. But before continuing, and as I just said, we have one show in Geneva in late August, followed by another one in Neuchâtel. And on the 1st of September, we will officially celebrate our 10th anniversary. So what I am thinking to do is how we could combine all this into something pretty awesome and organize a baby watchmaking road trip, visiting both uh, these shows and having a good time together. I know that there are still travel uh, restrictions, but uh, by then I hope things would have settled down a bit. Uh, so at least we could do something special until we will be able to put our watch trips back on the menu. Well, if some of you guys are interested, we've just put up a form on our website uh, just to grasp your interest. And we see how we take it from uh, there for a proper Viva watchmaking party, right? Okay, enough excitement, and uh, let's now talk about watches, and I will first talk of what I am wearing, because this one is quite special, and I just got it still hot from the oven. This is not a commercial watch, but a watch the team of MBNF produced to thank some of their friends and customers, and reason why it's not called MBNF, but instead it's a MAD edition, the MAD edition one, in reference to the MAD gallery, where you can indeed buy MBNF watches, but also other examples of kinetic art. And as you can imagine, well, being mad myself, this one really resonates with me, of course. So one of the main uh, design features is this really special oscillating mass, which whirls like crazy as they reverse an automatic movement to have this on top. A movement with a unidirectional winding system, the only solution to get this super fast rotating mass going, uh, something you could also enjoy with the HM3. Well, this watch of the day is in fact similar to a tact watch as you read the time on the side uh, between the lugs. You have two discs, one for the hour, one for the minutes, and you can discreetly read time without having to twist your wrist too much. So yes, pretty crazy and fun piece, very happy to wear it, and it already sparked quite some attention around me, but by looking at it, well, you can easily imagine why. I mean, this is no ordinary timepiece. And yes, in the dark, it's pretty cool too. But again, it's not publicly for sale, only for friends and customers of the brand. So if you really want it, well, I guess you have to become an MBNF wearer. And this could be the case with the new and recently uh, introduced uh, version of the LM101, but this time featuring the double hairspring system first seen last year with their successful collaboration with H. Moser. So this new watch will not be limited, something rare enough to be noted, but it's limited by production capabilities and only 50 watches per year should come out in three a different variation, white gold and purple dial, red gold and deep blue dial, and finally a steel with light blue uh, dial. Okay, next watch, and let's now talk about Oberg, who are celebrating, if we can say so, the end of the UR105. Uh, they're doing this in style with a tantalum version, limited to 12 pieces, also comes with this uh, hood feature first seen on the UR105 CT. The 105 has been a pretty successful watch in their collection, so as with the end of the UR210 replaced by the UR220, I wouldn't be too surprised if we will see uh, some kind of updated version of it with another reference number in the future, because yes, I mean, it's a cool watch. Okay, let's now talk about a watch widely talked about in the recent weeks uh, with the new Tudor Black Bay Ceramic. But instead of going for a full description, I will uh, focus more on its uh, certification process and what it implies. So first of all, this is a cool watch. I must admit uh, for the price, they have 4,500 Swiss francs. I mean, that's pretty cool. Nothing to argue there, but yes, this watch is METAS certified. And this is something really interesting to expand on. The Swiss METAS institution has so far only certified Omega watches, and it's definitely one of the most stringent certification process out there. The most public dimension of this certification used by Omega is that the watches must resist magnetic fields of 15,000 Gauss. But it goes way beyond this. I mean, you probably all heard about the COSC certification, but this one only tests the movement 
And to be certified, the movement needs to be in a range of minus four to plus six seconds per day. With the Meta's version, it's the full watch that is tested, and this makes much more sense. So much can happen to a COSC certified movement once it's encased, and therefore with Meta's, the full watch is tested in six different positions at two different temperatures and two levels of power reserve, full power and at 33%, so quite thorough and more importantly, much closer to actual wearing conditions. The timing deviation allowed is only five seconds per day instead of 10 uh, with the COSC, and watches are also put into a pressure test of 200 meters. Well, once you go through all this, your watch will benefit from the master certified label, and we know that Tudor will not certify all their watches, only a few thousands per year compared to a couple of hundred thousand for Omega. But what is really interesting is that you can highly doubt that Tudor went through this just on their own. Omega has been uh, quite successful over the recent years and even biting a bit on Rolex's uh, territory. So one can quite easily imagine that having Tudor watches benefiting from the same certification but at significantly uh, lower price point than the Omega Master Certified watches means that they are going more on a head-to-head -head battle with them but fighting from below if I can say so. And I wouldn't be too surprised to see Rolex using the Meta certification in the near future. So Omega will find themselves a bit crushed between uh, Rolex on top and Tudor below. Quite a smart move, uh, obviously not one uh, really publicly discussed. And it's just my interpretation of it. But all in all, and this is really good uh, for all of us, uh, as it means that these kind of watches, meaning at this price point, are just going to get more and more precise. And we know that they will probably never be as precise as your phone, but it's still important that we associate the notion of proper chronometry with modern quality watches. It is a very important differentiator for brands that want to be perceived as being really serious and committed when it comes to the quality of their watches, and thus it consolidates even more the position of these brands. Then there will be the rest of the pack, and in such a competitive environment, this will most definitely play in the favor of those going down the Meta certification route. Of course, this is not as vital for much smaller brands selling something uh, different, like an artistic vision. And I'm not saying that they are not also pursuing for this uh, quest of best precision, but it's simply different and commercially less important. So yeah, precision is a quest, a difficult one to reach uh, with the mechanical movement, and mainly achieved today thanks to the use of anti-magnetic materials for the oscillator in particular, uh, in the example I just mentioned. And this leads me to another parallel subject. A little while back, Frédéric Constant introduced the Slimline Monolithic Manufacture, a watch with a totally new type oscillator using compliant mechanics, architecture and materials to achieve something quite remarkable. So we had already seen another example of this with the Zenith DeFi Lab introduced in 2017, but between the big expectations of the time and reality, well, let's say that there has been a little gap. A gap which is now addressed by this Frédéric Constant collection as the technology uh, seems to really work on these models and can be produced in much higher volumes, though this uh, initial series was limited to around 500 watches. So I did see this watch in real life, and as with many other different uh, models of the brand, where they do like to open work their dials to show part of the gear trains and the balance wheel, uh, here it's more or less the same, a part that you can't almost recognize that uh, this is indeed an oscillator that you have here in the middle, and for some obvious reason. The first one is that the entire regulating organ is one and one only component, and the second reason is that it beats at 40 hertz. Yeah, I hope you heard me right, 40 hertz, that 288,000 oscillations per hour, so it's totally normal that your eye doesn't see anything just way too fast. But we know that uh, this has a big impact on the chronometrical performances of the watch, even though it is quite difficult to assess with standard measuring equipment. But also on the power reserve, as this watch holds 80 hours of power reserve. So you could ask yourself, how, this is, uh, how is this possible with such a high frequency? Well, with a regular balance wheel, its amplitude is about 300 degrees, meaning that it goes back and forth on 300 degrees. But with this new one, the amplitude is only six degrees and therefore uses much less energy. Okay, so what I mainly want to say about this breakthrough goes along the line of what I was saying before. 
Modern mechanical watches need to keep an edge and I'm talking about big production volume watches and the fact that it's written uh, Swiss made on them is not enough. Okay, on a pure aesthetic standpoint, I much prefer slower beating balance wheel. There is something much more poetic about it. And it is a pleasure to look at also. And that's why you will often see brands preferring to use a 2.5 Hertz frequency. But again, for large volumes where you know that the watch's movement can only be machine finished for this uh, price positioning, then why not go with the best performing, the most adequate technology available and even hide the movement? Rolex watches are of course mainly machine produced, they don't have open case backs and it doesn't seem to bother anybody and I can promise you that they have nothing to hide. Their movement are extremely well executed when you open them up and for those who want to see how it looks like, well I clearly invite you to check a previous video we did uh, when we deconstructed a sub with our good friend uh, Peter Speaker and uh, well you'll see what I mean. Anyhow, I think this technology developed by Dutch company Flexus uh, definitely has something extremely interesting to offer for the future of watchmaking as an industry and I really appreciate that there are still so many fields to explore. Of course, I mean it's not applicable to all segments of the industry, there is no point for that, but there is for sure a place for innovation and different ways of doing things which are totally pertinent are adding your competitive advantage and ultimately to the benefit of the end consumer. But going back uh, to poetry and super slow beat, I guess some of you guys have already seen the superb table clock Ulysse Nardin introduced recently. A clock beating at one hertz with a massive balance wheel sitting on top and what a pleasure to look at it. With such a speed, I think it makes you think that time is passing by more slowly. There's something really soothing and at the same time paying a tribute to marine chronometers, something of course very dear to the brand. Though this clock has been uh, produced by Lippe, the famous uh, clockmaker who collaborates with uh, many different brands. Right, Mr. Balthazar? And uh, something additional and quite crazy, but this clock holds almost one year of power reserve. Just crazy, absolutely love it. But Lippe also does uh, clocks that uh, they sell under their own name. And for instance, they just launched a plain uh, shaped one called Time Flies. And for a guy that likes planes and uh, flying, well, that's a pretty cool time telling object too. It comes in uh, three variations, matte black, silver or golden version. I let you choose, I made my choice. Okay, we're reaching the end of this edition of Primetime and just want to tell you that we have a different type of video coming your way very soon as we wanted to understand a bit better the behind the scene of a very successful Kickstarter campaign, a recent one with the example of Fulan Mari. So thanks for watching, hope everything is going well for you and your families. Uh, we'll keep you posted about this uh, Viva watchmaking party. Uh, check our website for that and uh, well, till then, an officially and huge Viva Watchmaking to you. All the very best. See you soon.